Hello, and welcome to another episode of Boundless Body Radio. I'm your host, Casey Ruff, and today we have another amazing guest to reintroduce to you now. Krishna Hanks is a returning guest on our show. Be sure to check out her first appearance in episode 304 of Boundless Body Radio. Krishna Hanks is the co-owner of Square One Wellness, providing low-carbohydrate and ketogenic nutrition coaching and personalized fitness training to individuals, groups, and organizations. Krishna has earned the title of Coach Practitioner from the Noakes Foundation, a select group of individuals chosen to train in the low-carbohydrate and ketogenic lifestyle. Krishna is now also working with Dr. Philip Ovedia, also a former podcast guest and author of The Stay Off My Operating Table, and his iFix Hearts team, which is all about improving metabolic health. Krishna is a former worksite wellness subject matter expert for the CDC's Work at Health program, which included supporting companies across the nation in establishing comprehensive wellness initiatives. As if all of that weren't enough, she is the best-selling author of Finding Lifestyle Sanity, a Survival Guide. Krishna's approachable style allows her to connect with clients of all ages who are at every level of fitness to navigate individual paths for, their, for living their healthiest lifestyles. Krishna Hanks, what an absolute honor it is to welcome you to Boundless Body Radio. Thank you so much, Casey. It's a real privilege to be here for the second time. And I have to say, I feel very humbled because you have had some of the most amazing guests on your show <laughs> over the years. And I was 304, but you've got so many past that, um, and, you know, from Ben Bigman to Nina Teicholz. And what I really love about you, always do your homework. The interviews are well-researched. And you're giving actionable stuff. It's not just sort of things out there that people can't take home with them. So bravo to you. That is incredibly kind coming <laughs> from you. We have had amazing guests. You you complimented us last time on that as well. But like getting to talk with you and meet you and some of the other people that are just, you know, maybe they're not like have billions and billions of followers online and they're maybe not the big, as big of a deal as Ben Bickman or Nina Teichels, but are doing such great work all over the place. I love connecting with people like you. And I loved our conversation last time, very much looking forward to getting an update. And we've got so much to cover. First thing is first, this is an awesome time of year where every Sunday I expect to see a post from you. <laughs> I'm wearing my Red Bull Max for step and hat. <laughs> for this conversation. <laughs> How amazing has it been to watch uh, a, somebody from the Netherlands just crush it in Formula One? Oh my gosh, it's so much fun. It's definitely a Sunday ritual. Uh, of course, you know, my husband is born in Amsterdam, so he's familiar also with Max Verstappen's dad. Wow. The, the tradition goes on, but we're, we're just loving it. Last year was an amazing uh, Formula One tour and these first two races right off the bat um yeah i guess i should have been wearing orange today but we're loving it <laughs> <laughs> it's so awesome it's so awesome yeah I'm, I'm like a lot of people in the states where i was not familiar with formula one at all i got used to it from the netflix series drive to survive and now i'm watching every single session all the practices all the qualifying i love the sport it's so fun to learn about everything that's going on um and it, it's it's fun i'll watch the entire race i love watching the champagne ceremony afterwards and they also do the national anthems which inevitably is going to be the dutch national anthem and then they do the <laughs> Austrian um, national anthem right after that because the team is from Austria. So I, the funniest clip I saw this last week was of the soccer team and they were playing the Dutch national anthem and somebody posted, why are they playing the F1 outro? <laughs> That's perfect. Yes. So perfect. And I, I, the other thing I thought of would be weird. The next time I just hear the Dutch anthem, I'm going to think something's missing when they don't immediately go right to the Austrian uh, national anthem right after that. Well, so it's wait, even, the song. Is it it's a, it's really fun to see that I think its popularity has grown globally. I mean, F Formula One has been popular for a lot of countries for years, but definitely it's fun. Uh, I've enjoyed your enthusiasm and your passion and being able to share it with other Americans these days. Oh, it's, <laughs> it's been so fun to follow. And speaking of passion, I have been wanting to be adopted by the Dutch to cheer for their sports teams for a very, very long time. I was first familiar with Dutch fans during the Tour de France on, on a special climb called Alpe d'Huez. There's an entire corner called Dutch Corner that looks like it's like 20 or 30 people deep in just bright orange going bananas. It's like a bicycle can barely fit through there. Um, the speed skating oval for the Olympics is about 15 minutes away from my house. So whenever they have a World Cup event, it's about a quarter of the stadium are people from the Netherlands. It just, it, they, they look like they have so much fun. They show up to the soccer games that they have. The one against um, Argentina was amazing in the World Cup and a, a classic game. The, your fans look amazing. 
Yeah, um, well, definitely, um, we would gladly adopt you. Thank you, perfect. <laughs> thank you, thank you very much. I was definitely cheering for, um, I was definitely cheering for the Netherlands against Argentina. Since my team is Brazil, I'm always cheering against Argentina, but that that didn't really turn out. So anyway, thank you for adopting me. I appreciate it. I will. I'll, I'll represent well. <laughs> I'm sure you will. <laughs> uh, well, I'll change my hat now, literally. But let's um, let's reintroduce you to our audience. You have a really cool story that we talked about in episode 304. But let's remind the audience, you know, how you got into health and fitness and how you got to where you were, at least up to our last conversation with with diet and nutrition and that kind of thing. And maybe we can talk about how your mind has changed or you've evolved a little bit in that time. Absolutely. So the sort of let's do the first part uh the the cliff nose version here uh, oh you are literally changing your head i love it um literally changing uh, my hat i grew up in a sports family my dad was a basketball coach my brother became a basketball coach he's not doing that any longer he's switched careers so i grew up also in illinois which is a very basketball crazy state um so i've i've had coaching mentors from let's say birth, <laughs> watching my dad, he was a very successful. I think he still holds a record for the most seasons of t- winning 20 games, 20 years back to back. Um, and so that was the start. I did all the usual things, I did cheerleading, I did gymnastics, but I started dancing professionally at the age of 15. And that career lasted me to about the age of 43. So quite extensive, but throughout that, I was teaching dance. I became certified in all kinds of things. I know your wife is also Pilates certified. Um, so we have that in common. You do other things as you're growing up, personal training, all that thing throughout my dance career. So I've always been sort of teaching involved in that personal training aspect. A couple educational degrees along the way. I've got my master's in kinesiology uh, from Indiana University, got my MBA from University of San Francisco. So always some education, tons of certifications in there uh, from, as you mentioned in the intro, worksite wellness, Iyengar yoga, but more and more uh, in the nutrition realm. So how did I get into the nutrition piece? Part of that became when you're working individually with individuals, you see that it's more than just that exercise piece. Um, There are so many aspects to trying to help someone live a vibrant, healthy life. And throughout the years and as it went on and on, the, the nutrition piece just became bigger and bigger and bigger in terms of the struggles that people were having. And then all that came home to me because towards the end of my professional dance career, I started having health issues. I had been what I considered really top athlete. I consider professional dance at the level of professional athletes, a lot of training, very strict schedule. I I got what I call ill, sort of had weird joint issues, lots of inflammation, just general pain throughout the day, doing normal stuff. And for me, as someone who had always been able to do every, my body did everything I ever asked it, all of a sudden it was hardly doing anything I was asking it. And this took me down, and again, this journey of, What's going on? Two years in the medical system, nobody could find anything. You must have all kinds of, you must have an uh, autoimmune disease that we can't figure out what it is, blah, 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 blah. What I call the medical hamster wheel, round and round. Till finally, one a physical therapist friend of mine said, you ever thought about your diet? You know, what do you mean you bristle up, you know, every, my diet's perfect. I've been vegetarian for 20 years. Okay. Big, huge light bulb. I apologize to him for being a jerk the next day. <laughs> um, so that took me down the rabbit hole. And then we got down together, Robert and I, the rabbit hole even clearer through the work of Gary Topps. Um, he discovered this article, what if it's all been a big fat lie? that led him to good calories, bad calories. Long story short, I changed my diet, I got better. So that was my personal experience. And then that coupled with, I just then sucked my teeth into everything I could, did every course Nutrition Network offered, uh, got certified by the Society of Metabolic Health Practitioners, done Georgia East course, just more and more and more. And 
all the books along the way that said there's just so much here. And then started focusing and seeing, you know, trying it out with certain clients and seeing, hey, this stuff works. Um, so that is kind of a roundabout global way, um, but that's, uh, again, our personal story. My husband, Robert, had a slightly different story. He was having allergies and GERD and things, and we both got better through changing up our nutrition. I didn't know that about Robert. Uh, yeah. Um, he had always suffered from really lots of allergy problems and, again, had from, you know, we were both doing a very high carbohydrate diet. Me, when I took the meat out, I I just became a kind of carboholic, you know, bread, pasta, rice. I was looking for energy. Um, and he'd kind of done the same. There was quite a movement towards more bread in the Netherlands and things like that. Um, and when we took that away, we both saw amazing changes. Wow. Um, yeah. yeah. Wow. I'm continually surprised that it still surprises me. The, all the, the laundry list of things that get improved when we start fixing diet. I think the movement piece and the stress piece and all these other things play a part, but diet for me seems to be the linchpin of it. It solves so many things. In fact, I was just talking to a client yesterday kind of about this. It's like the one diet that like weight loss is not even like a top five or top 10 thing that most people talk about. That's, that's like, that's fun, but that's like on the side, like to improve your brain or to get rid of joint issues like you did or fix digestive health. That's where the money's at. That's amazing. And this is so key. What you just said there, Casey, well, cause I didn't have a weight problem and therefore everyone thought it was okay that, you know, at the end of my two year trying to figure out what was wrong with me, their, their analysis was you just need, um, uh, mental therapy. Right. We think that you're, you know, kind of depressed because of your quitting your dance career. And there's all these other things that you basically just should go get therapy. But, you know, and again, we're seeing with this mental health resurgence from Dr. Georgia Eid and Chris Palmer. Yes, nutrition can fix. But my problem was a joint problem and an inflammation problem. And I think, like you say, weight is is really just a bonus for some people. I think it is that linchpin or like we say the foundation. All those other pieces are important, but this is the one piece that most people need a lot of help with. Yeah. Um, and and that's really where we start. Uh, anytime you're working one on one with it, there are many other things that come into play. But having that support system to help them see there could be another way. Yeah, I love that. And you were somebody in particular who found that not only going to a whole foods diet was better for you. So eliminating processed foods and, you know, people talk about whole food diets and fruits and vegetables and that kind of thing as well. But we also know for some people in certain situations, eliminating plant foods might be even better. Can you tell us about your journey towards kind of a carnivore diet? Yeah, great question. Uh, certainly in the very beginning, uh, it was quite a switch to just start adding back meat. And, and I did probably what every long time uh, vegetarian would do first, some eggs, then some broth, right? And then you slowly do the fish and meat on, on that way. But as it going, so and think back now, and I'm sometimes amazed at this, we've been doing together this lifestyle, Robert and I, for 17 years now. So we started back in around 2007. And first it was just more low carb and that worked. That made big changes for us, especially joint wise, eliminating that. The longer we went along, the more we just organically found we don't need so many plants. And in fact, sometimes it felt like performance level, me at workout, taking long endurance hikes, and also just convenience. We both work 40 to 50 hour weeks. Oftentimes it seemed like we were throwing plants away. We'd buy them and not cook them, those kind of things. But it was more on the performance level. And I think that's a key. I, I have this philosophy that nutrition should be about maximum performance. It's not about a punishment or a reward, which is where nutrition often falls in the U.S. You know, I, I can't have this because of I didn't work out or I get to have my double latte because I walked 10,000 steps. It revolves in that. And 
when you start sort of analyzing what helps you perform better, I found, and we found in our house, going more, we call it meat-centric. I, can't, I wouldn't say we're now full-on carnivore. Uh, you know, we do eggs. We both do some dairy. Uh, but fruits are pretty much a rarity. Plants, pretty much a rarity. But it evolved over that time. And it wasn't like we said all of a sudden, okay, you know what? We're doing carnivore now. It just kind of happened that way. Plus... I'm not shy about my age. I'm 66. I, you know, I think from that moment of turning 60 on, the emphasis to get adequate protein was more prevalent. You know, I, I, I did see, you know, uh, early in my 60s, like feeling like my muscle quality was diminishing a little bit. And while I had vigorous exercise program, I think I was pretty much under eating on protein. And I find the easiest way to up your protein is to go for the meat. It, it's an easy choice, whether you're doing ground, you don't have to always be doing ribeye steaks, but ground beef is great, ground whole, whatever, you know, lights your fire. That just seemed the easiest choice to up the protein a little bit and enhance the performance. Mm, which then gave you more muscle mass, improved your bone density, improved your joints, and all of your health has been improving. You told us two years ago when, you, when we talked that at 64, you were feeling more amazing than you were 20 years previous. Are you still feeling even better and better? Totally, totally on that. And my muscle quality has improved. My, you know, uh, scores in terms of, you know, I was borderline right after my... Um, uh, dance career with osteopenia, right? Uh, heading towards osteoporosis. So a lot of numbers and those things have improved and my weight hasn't changed that much, but you know, it's, it's your body composition. And I think that women my age, we can really get busy with the scale. We can get busy with the calories um, all those kind of things. But at the end of the day, it's really about your body composition. Wow. I, I did a free consultation with somebody just a few days ago. She was about your age. She's got some weight to lose. She had started kind of listening in on, on, on low carbohydrate podcast and has already lost a few pounds, which is great. Just steadily like gaining three pounds a year. She said, just, just, just little gain, little gain, little gain ended up it, 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 doing really, really well. And as part of the consultation, I decided to ask her, like, w- imagine what your life could be what like an audacious goal of some kind like you're you're in your 60s you still have tons of time left what would you love to be able to do and so i'm going to ask you the same thing like what, what things are amazing that you absolutely love to do because you have taken care of your health in an unconventional way i think it's continue to to feel energized and, and working many people my age are retiring they're like stopping doing what they want to do. They're, um, you know, thinking about taking more time off. I see this as, well, you know, maybe I just hit my my next prime of whatever. I, I want to feel, I, I'd like to do 10 years from now, you and I are back doing show number 8,000, <laughs> whatever, <laughs> saying, well, I'm still excited about working. I still love my workouts. I still enjoy getting sunshine and being outdoors and can do it with the vigor I have now. Mm, Great answer. I absolutely love that. I also love the term meat centric. And I realize I have to be probably more careful when I'm talking about carnivore, because when I think of carnivore in my head, I think of the definition of a hyper carnivore in nature, which is 75% of calories coming from animal products. So when somebody says they're doing carnivore, but they had a cheat because, you know, once a week they have an avocado or they have fermented vegetables, like in my mind, I'm like, well, that's carnivore. That's a carnivore diet. You can have other plant foods. It's just the way we define it is a majority of your calories are coming from animal foods. Um, And so I need to be more careful about that because I think some people think carnivore and they think the strictest version, you're only eating like beef, salt, water, and that's it. And I I think more people would be open to trying it if they understood that, yeah, there might be a period of time that you're probably going to want to be pretty strict. But after that, it's not like this is going to be, you can only eat beef for the rest of your life. This is going to be something where you can start to add things back in and see how you feel. And that seems like something that you've learned as you've continued on since the last time we chatted. 
Absolutely. And I think maybe that just comes from client experience. Uh, I think that, well, we know there's so much information out there. Um, and that's, that's part of working with the coach is to help you turn down the noise, I like to say. But I think you're, I think there's a lot of pressure to fit into a particular named nutrition source, whether it's keto, whether it's carnivore, whether it's, you know, vegan vegetarian. And I do think meat centric offers this idea that you have to prioritize your protein. Personally, I think you can't do it without having animal products. However, there might be people who can find some way to do the vegetarian thing and still maintain their muscle mass. I I think that's really hard if unless you're supplementing like crazy and you are, you know, just phenomenally on top of it. Um, that said, if some people some people will get very sort of close and less willing to listen to their own body if they say. If you say, okay, you're, we're going to do carnivore. What you mean? I'm only going to have meat, salt, and water. And then they are already, you know, putting up some, some resistance and some boundaries. I, I think allowing that inner, that, you know, uniqueness of each person uh, to flourish is helpful when we're trying to look for a sustainable lifestyle. And I, I think that's one of my philosophies is the reason I do this is I find it easy for the clients that we work with to, you know, they say things like, wow, it's so fun to not be hungry all the time. Or I don't see why people think this is difficult because for me, it's easy. And that I think helps sometimes through titles, through yeah. not sort of labeling yourself as this or or what Amy Berger says, I'm keto without the crazy. Yeah. <laughs> I love her. She's awesome. I love that. Yeah, no, that's a great way to say it. And I've told you in the past, I'm a huge fan of your writing. You do a great job writing your articles. And I love that you write an article. You've written it, I think, three times now. Every few years, you'll write, what am I eating now? And again, I, I love to see how what the things you're including, what is simple for you, the recipes that you enjoy, the techniques, all that kind of stuff. And so I wanted to talk about your latest one that you wrote. But before then, you had some parameters. I don't expect you to remember the parameters. <laughs> word for word, but what were some of the things that you were thinking about when you're thinking about like, what is a good diet? What are some rules we should be thinking about as far as like, how do we construct our diet? What are some of the parameters you found to be very important? Um, so gives me energy. I say to levels are, you know, right on spot. Um, it should be easy to skip a meal. In other words, let's say you, you had breakfast and all of a sudden you're working and then all the time you go, okay, well, I'm ready for dinner now. Um, you know, that what we call fat adapted metabolic flexibility, whatever term you like to give to it. I think that you should be able to be able to do your workouts with full out energy um, in terms of that. Some other things that have come up to why we've gone more carnivore, I think is also the ease uh, to feel that it's... <laughs> You're not always having to throw a hundred different things into a meal. You might just have a meal uh, and it is just meat and that's not a big deal. Or you might have eggs with some sauerkraut and maybe a piece of avocado and you enjoy that. Um, and, but I, I think the main thing is it keeps your, you, you're not fluctuating your weight that much. It's pretty stable. Um, it's feeling you again, as I said, CTT wise and, I can do all the things I want to do physically. Mm, that's great. Great definition. I love that. So as you have been strict carnivore and now have opened things up, what have you found personally? Again, this is a very, very personal question. So for the listener, for somebody watching, your answer at home might be very, very different than your answer as I'm asking you the question. But what plant foods have you have you found to be enjoyable, good for you? You've you've liked them. They've not had any like negative effects. So Plant foods are pretty scarce these days. And we do like fermented things like kimchi, sauerkraut, um, if that's included in there. <laughs> um, you know, we, certainly if we're having people over, we'll, we'll offer some green leafy vegetables, some, you know, broccoli or maybe, um, you know, some asparagus or maybe even uh, if we know individuals like that. But 
during the week, we're pretty much ground beef. My husband makes this big dish called a keto sheet burger, you know, five pounds of ground beef, a layer of bacon, a layer oh of cheese. Goodness. It goes, goes in the oven and we just slice off a piece throughout the week. So we, we love big one pan dishes here. Uh, another thing we do on a regular basis is an egg casserole, egg sausage. Uh, um, sometimes we throw some mushrooms in it uh, and cheese. Those are really handy for us working. You can take what you want. You can go. Um, those are, again, simplicity kind of rules uh, in our house these days. But from the plant perspective, it's on the low side these days. I do. I will say I'll have a sweet potato uh, now and then. Um, I can have a few more carbohydrates than my uh, my husband. Um, and if we're making a stew in the wintertime, we might throw some carrots and some potatoes in it at that time. And we might not sometimes. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. That's a great yeah. answer. I get asked this question from time to time. Um, and I know how I kind of feel about it now, but I'm curious to see how you would ask about this. Uh, obviously when we're talking about carnivore diet and people introducing more plant foods. Generally speaking, we're talking about whole foods, right? Fruits, vegetables, whatever fermented foods that you find to be okay for you. that don't make your blood sugar go crazy. Don't have, make you have like aches and pains and that kind of thing. Um, what about like quote unquote cheat days? Do you ever have days where you just completely go off the rails and have like pizza and ice cream? Um, is that something you find to be like, do you, do you, want pizza and ice cream? Do you ever want to go off your diet? Like, how do you feel about cheat days? Uh, I personally don't do them. And I, again, that gets back to, and maybe this has something to do with my, you know, long time as a professional dancer. This gets to me, the cheat days gets to this whole punishment and reward thing. And I had two years with severe joint issues and a cheat day to me just sounds like a lot of joy pain. I can imagine it um, in that way. That's not to say I go to a family birthday party. Somebody's having, you know, birthday cake. I have a piece of birthday cake on something. I, um, I, I, that that that's going to happen uh, on there. Or but there'll be times when I'll say no. I'm not really interested in it. But I do, I don't work with cheat days and I I'm generally it's not something that I advocate for within my client you know uh, base uh, that said if that's something that someone really feels attached to wants to hang on to we'll work around it mm. in, in that way but I I don't see it as that much fun I, I know some people really like it or it, for me it, it's not attractive and but again that's not to say I never have a piece of pizza or I never have a piece of uh, birthday cake, but it's I'm not planning it as a special day. It doesn't, to me, sound like fun. Yeah, that's a great way to say it. I could not agree more with you. Um, it's like it's like knowing you're doing something that you know is going to be unpleasant. Is it the worst thing in the world to like go back to feeling anxious and having anxiety and have my my digestion suck and know my sleep's gonna suck? Like it's not the worst, but it's not fun. I wouldn't choose that. And so you just I, I find the more you're kind of in this realm of eating, there's less and less and less of those occasions that sound even like you said, like fun, it doesn't sound fun to like spend a day and a half, like in discomfort when I know what it's like to not feel that. And that's really fun to go on hikes and paddleboard and all the fun things we like to do. I just find that cheat days, they just, they, they suck. You're right. Like they're not that fun. They're not worth it. Right. And that goes back to your question that you asked about parameters. Like one of my parameters is to feel good and be able to do the workouts or take a hike or just wake up, you know, I'm an early riser. I get up at 5 a.m. One of my favorite things to do is have my espresso with a little bit of half and half. And if I had a day where I was having all kinds of crappy food from it, even that morning coffee is not going to be that much fun. <laughs> uh, and I, I, I have this funny, not to share sort of too personal story, but if I have too much sugar or too much carbohydrates, from all my years of dance, I have one particular toe that's very arthritic and it's like you i'll wake up the next day and that thing will be swollen and it will look kind of like I'm some 
got something terribly wrong with me and you think that isn't worth it wow, <laughs> wow. yeah again when, when we're talking about carnivore diet I, I i hope that we're not you know getting people the idea that like it, you're only going to eat meat for the rest of your life it doesn't need to be like that and i wish more people also would understand that that like if you try this you will learn that the cheats are just not that worth it food doesn't taste the same it will punish you more and more and more and it's not it's not like you're going to have to force it. It's not like crazy willpower that you're going to have to use for the rest of your life. You're just going to start feeling so good that those things will just kind of slip away on their own. hundred uh, percent. Again, it's about ease. If we were, this is not a diet, it's a lifestyle and very cliche to say that. However, my goal as a coach is to help people find ways of continuing not only to fuel themselves, but through their exercise, through their stress management, through sleep. Uh, and it, it's a little bit, I think Ted Nyman actually coined this phrase, start eating now the way you want to eat the rest of your life. Mm. And that I think is really important. And there might be some nuances, changes, you know, there might come a time where I don't enjoy fermented foods right now. I do. They're kind of fun. Don't do them every day, but uh, they. I like. I like the crunch. I like the taste, um, and mixing it up. Uh, and I think it's important to be able to continue this and not feel I'm only. Well, I, I'm only going to do it for two or three weeks, and then I'm going to go off the rails. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Yeah, I love that. I want to talk about your work with Dr. Philip Ovedi. I think it's wonderful that you're working with him. He is awesome. I love him and Jack and the, the podcast they do is really great. And I know they've hosted you in the past. Mm -hmm. um, before we do, this is insane. Before we do, I want to talk about a document that you sent me that I was <laughs> unfamiliar with. This came out a few months ago that you are in. Congratulations. <laughs> you made it in this document. I, <laughs> you sent this to me last night. It took me half the document to make sense of everything. I couldn't tell for a little while, like, is this pro meat? Is this anti meat? Like, what, what is this all about? I have never, I, I've seen some crazy stuff in nutrition, like learning for the first time, like you did from somebody like Gary Taubes, that, that fat is okay. Like, whoa, what? That fat's not okay. You can't eat fat. Learning that um, people could eat carnivore diets. You could eat only meat and never eat vegetables and you'd be fine. It's like mind blowing. You learn about the oxalates from Sally Norton. You learn about, you know, the Seventh Day Adventist Church and Blue Zones from Belinda Fetke and all these crazy, crazy stories, how Kellogg's got started, like all these bizarre things in nutrition. This is one of the, the weirdest things I've ever 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 seen you sent me a document that you were in can you tell us about this so this organization and um is called changing markets foundation and uh, the document you're talking is about and i had to look because the title's kind of long called truth lies and culture wars and they're calling it the great disruption Again, my perspective, it's somehow tied to this whole idea of the Great Reset that the WHO, the World Health Organization, is promoting. And in this document, they're calling myself, but many, many others, right, as people who are spreading misinformation and being very pro-meat. So... You can decipher that however you want. So if individuals like myself or many others find that meat is really beneficial to them from a health perspective, yes, it's not a peer-reviewed science document, but there are many individuals who are finding whatever nutritional path to work well for them. And if some of us have found through our own experimentation that when we switched from being vegetarian to having meat in our diet, we did very well. And there's several of us, particularly, it's very interesting, particularly as females uh, in that document. And we, uh, those of us who show meat dishes, who write about how our health improved through meat, somehow this group decided that we were spreading misinformation. Again, there's other more, way more important people in there from Sean Baker to uh, Paul Saladino, I think is mentioned in there. The list is endless. But it's, from my perspective, I was, I thought it very funny, but it, on the other hand, it's very scary to think 
there's organizations busy telling people that, hey, well, these people might have gotten healthy, but we don't think it's okay. Again, this, this, this Belinda Gafitke has written so much about the influence of this, as you mentioned, the Seventh-day Adventist on the vegan vegetarian lifestyle. Uh, Nina Chaihoff has done an incredible job historically seen. There are many organizations now trying to influence what and how much, particularly when it comes to meat, we can eat. I think that is a scary path. And how I ended up on that list, I don't know. Um, maybe they just like the photo, who knows? <laughs> or there, there are not many people my age, but I, I still think it is important for us to have these conversations that say, hey, you know what? There is not one diet for anyone. We've tried that for 50, 60 years with the dietary guidelines. It's been a colossal, uh, what we call, mistake. <laughs> Uh, or you just have to look around, go to a shopping mall these days and see, it hasn't worked out. We we said you should eat this for everyone and it, it hasn't worked out. So we tried that experiment. My philosophy personally as a coach is to say, there isn't one diet for anyone. We have all these variations. However, we should also be able to say, you know, carnivore might just be really good for some people. Yeah. Wow. Well, okay. So the post that you were featured in, congratulations for making the document, by the way. That's great. It's, it was fun to see, like, yeah, you see Nina and the, the major people that you see, but you also see, like, Roxana Sotobeer. Like, like she's not a massive influencer or, like, Brett Ender. Like, yeah, he's doing great work with Meat Mafia, but he's not, like, has millions and millions of followers. And, and so, and they made the list also. And so you see the post that you had made, you're flexing, you look great, you're in your 60s. And the post mm -hmm. is like, you know, one thing that's really helped me as I've aged is to really, I'm, I'm paraphrasing obviously, but it's like prioritize protein, getting more meat and eggs in my diet has really helped me. It didn't say like, you have to eat all meat, you don't never eat any vegetables. It was nothing to do with that. It was just a post that said like, look, I feel really great. I'm aging well. You even saw like the number of likes and comments on your posts. It, 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 it did go viral i wouldn't say i think it was like in the double or triple digits that it got out to but oh my goodness it is a little scary to see this and this like narrative of like people in the pro meat space are all conspiring like like it, it showed our tactics of like disparaging vegans and like making vegans feel less masculine and it was just like whoa some of the things it was suggesting were pretty wild Totally. And to think also like Roxana, myself, you know, we're, we're small fish out there. And again, what we're doing is saying, Hey, this worked for me. And I saw improvements. You can say N is one. So is Nick Norwich N is one, Dave, you know, all those kind of things, but to say, and also express to people, this is an option. You should understand you have options. And just like within now this resurgence of metabolic health and saying, yeah, pharmacy might work well for some people, but nutrition as an option for treatment, that also should be an option. And I think it, it is really kind of a telltale sign of where we are at the moment that uh, we expressing, hey, I did, protein works well for me. Are, and we know that a large percentage, especially in my age group of females, you know, osteopenia, osteoporosis. Now I saw something come out this week, but what, 30 to 40% of people are iron deficient. What is one of the best sources for iron? Meat. Um, there's a, many reasons to want to at least explore it as an option. Yep. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, and just just like everything else that gets put out these days, it, it's like people might see that document and might say, it is extremely well done, by the way. Like, this is not something they put together last week. Like, this was heavily in, it investigated. You can see, like, how well done. It's 47 pages long with all everything, like the, the contents and the summary and all this stuff. Like, it, this, is, this was done by a team that took a lot of time to do this. Um, 
and, and just coming to some of the conclusions of like and seeing like like posts from Donald Trump Jr. and saying like the 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 far right is pushing this meat centric, meat forward agenda and like all the environmental destructiveness and like what that we're I nobody said anything about politics. We just think more people can have more protein and and we shouldn't like <laughs> avoid meat. It it was it was insane. It was crazy the conclusions it came to. Yeah, um, and you know what what's even maybe more scary than this, I bet there's other documents similar out there. And there's other organizations. This is one, they're calling themselves what the, you know, changing markets uh, is changing markets. Wh who else are they influencing and whose ears do they have? Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Eric Berg spoke at the last conference in, um, well, that was San Diego. Was it San Diego or was it Boca? Maybe? I believe. I, I, mean, I believe it was Boca. Was he was talking Boca. about how the message around keto was being suppressed, actively suppressed? Correct. And you know, he's he had some issues, tr almost being deplatformed and things like that. So there are certainly people who are having way more, um, you know, uh, suppression of their voices and their work. But I do think it's a sign of what we're up against. And, you know, again, this kind of leads into the whole medical system of, you know, right now I see many medical individuals being a great impediment to people having success. Right? Well, they'll say, oh, well, don't try this nutritional lifestyle because it's not sustainable. Or, you know, wow, yeah, you had great success, but... Um, you're still diabetic, even though you've reversed all your numbers. And it's not only the media we're up against, we're up against the medical system. And I just keep saying, hey, at least let, let some of, you know, know what your options are. Do your own homework, listen to podcasts like you have on there, read your books, investigate. And then at the end of the day, as you kind of started off is what are your parameters? What do you want? Do you want satiety? Do you want to be, you know, have good muscle quality? Do you want to live vibrantly, live for your kids, grandkids, whatever? Because that should then dictate your choices. Mm. Yeah, that is very well said. Um, I ended up sending the document to Nina since she was mentioned it, and I just wanted to see what she would respond. And she's she's aware of the document. She knows that she's in there. And she said something like, they, they're they watching us. They know exactly what we're doing and the things they're saying. And this is how strong and powerful this, this message is. The, 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 the anti-meat message is like, they'll go to these lengths to show this. And again, it's a little bit scary. Um, I think most of our listeners probably understand the direction you're going to take this question, but I want, I'd love to hear you explain it in your own words. Why, why is it that they're fighting against this so hard? You mentioned the medical industry. We'd know about the pharmaceutical industry and the food industry, all of these things. Like why are they fighting so hard against this movement? Um, there's a lot of jobs at stake, right? right? There's been a lot of um, money uh, invested in nonprofits, uh, you know, uh, governmental organizations based uh, on promoting their agenda, right? Whether that's the WHO agenda in terms of climate, but have you seen what the WHO is, is sort of saying in terms of, you know, we're going to be relegated to only eat like, you know, three to four ounces of meat a week, I think. Um, so I think there's a lot of jobs at stake on that. Um, there's uh, agendas from political organizations that want to, uh, that have a lot of ties to various other product companies, whether it's the, you know, Beyond Meat or plant-based options. Uh, I think the financial ties, you always have to follow the money on that. I think I agree with Dr. Eric Berg. Our message maybe hasn't gotten out there as well as some of the other organizations that promote, whether it's vegetarian or vegan diet. Um, you see the medical association wanting to partner a lot with the vegetarian philosophy, um, it, despite the fact that there being good science and lots of research showing that the low carbohydrate lifestyle is very beneficial. Just look at Verda Health and their, their uh, stories in that. Money always plays a role. Politics plays a role. Um, and 
I think those of us who have been are sort of being highlighted these days, we want options. I, I don't say everybody has to follow my option, but I think it, it, it's, it is, does a detriment to people when you blockade them from being able to choose themselves. Mm-hmm. Um, and I have been vocal about supporting farmers. I feel very strongly that I'm not for industrialized farming. And there are so many good farmers out there doing regenerative farming, doing things humanely. And unfortunately, the the climate piece has overtaken a lot of people in um, sort of forcing top-down uh, situations. I mean, farmers are really being uh, put in a hard place all across the globe. And as we started this conversation talking about the Netherlands, that's one of the biggest, they're struggling uh, very much. And I've been a very vocal supporter of the farmers and re- particularly those that are doing it really well. Um, and I, I think those are a lot of the reasons. Yeah, I, I think you're right. I think the follow the money is probably the best answer we're going to get. And when we're talking about these medical systems, we then find people who are very unique, like Philip Ovedia, who is a trained surgeon and, and discovers, you know, his own poor health through his own poor health, that a low carbohydrate diet and realized everything he had been taught was all nonsense. And so he had to depart from kind of, you know, the teachings that he had to do something a little bit different. We need more people like that. And so getting that message out is super helpful. What, what what was it like for you to decide that you wanted to start to work with him? So that right there, what you just said, I think um, as I've seen within my clients, you know, the medical system was oftentimes the biggest barrier to people achieving real long-term success because they'll do great. And then all of a sudden the doctor says, well, what about your cholesterol or what about your LDL and, um, or put up the barriers? Well, I'm not so sure if this is sustainable for you. And Philip is wonderful. Dr. Oveda, he, you know, has his own personal health journey, just working within people who believe it. They've found this route themselves. They see results within their client patients. And I really believe, and not just because I'm a coach, but it's the team effort that really makes the difference between someone being somewhat successful and really successful. Uh, You know, yes, your doctor can do a certain amount, but there's a whole lot other that you need other people for, whether that's the coach or some people might need therapy. Some people might need to really work on the addiction piece, Um, but it's the team, uh, maybe your personal trainer, the different people who really, those are the people who really excel. And that was a big uh, selling point for me. And also just being able to be around, you know, he's a heart surgeon. So, uh, you know, uh, my knowledge of, you know, how how to help individuals who are dealing uh, some spectrum of heart health is fascinating. And you see how you can also contribute to that. I've always been a team player and I, I love being within a team that all have a similar philosophy. That's that's. I find it's very unique. And I, I, I think we're growing. You're seeing like individuals like Dr. Ovadia, uh, many others, a good friend of mine, um, Dr. Bob Spear says, if your doctor doesn't get it, get a new doctor. <laughs> <laughs> uh. um, yeah. <laughs> I love that. I love that. Okay. Well, on that note, you sent me some results with somebody you've been working with. I'm not sure if it was inside of Dr. Philip Ovedia's platform mm-hmm. or not, but you sent me um, this this woman who got amazing results. Can you tell us about this woman and how, uh, how she was able to fix her own health and how that was responded to by people in the medical industry? Yeah. Um, I love this question. So um, this particular individual uh, was uh, through our our private business, through our Square One Wellness, actually someone I know from my hometown in Illinois, and had, you know, not not to share all of her information, but was in a really challenging spot, Uh, you know, had some very dramatic poor metabolic health numbers from things like HbA1c around the eight uh, to triglycerides around the five in the 500s. Um, some, wow. some really, you know, um, challenging numbers worked together for a year, 
lost around 80 pounds, got all her markers back in a good, not just a okay, but good range, has found this lifestyle easy to do. She's, I would say she's kind of, we're calling her keto carnivore-ish, uh, similar, but uh, this goes back after a year with this incredible results. And let's just say that her doctor was less than enthusiastic, like not not even wanted to congratulate her really, sort of saying things like, well, you're always going to be diabetic, but yet she's reversed all of her numbers. Um, and I like to say, this is what we're up against. You know, someone who was with this individual for years, maybe decades, and progressively got worse. Her, you know, heading in the direction of, you know, diabetes for life or, you know, heart attack or what other, other chronic disease might come from that and turn it all around, turn the ship completely around. And to not want to be happy for that individual, that's A, just sad. B, shows a lack of curiosity. I'm stealing that from Nick Norwitz. He says, why aren't doctors more curious? Uh, and the third piece is, wouldn't you want to just sort of understand what they've done to do that? Again, that's the curiosity piece of say, hey, amazing. How'd you do this? Because that's what Dr. Eric Westman said was his first learning curve, right? Of a patient came to him and he was like, how'd you do that? <laughs> wow. But th this is the challenge that we have. And, and you know, as health coaches, we obviously, we can't prescribe. We don't, uh, you know, treat we do all the other stuff. Yeah. And we can also get results. Yeah. Well, you're right. The the lack of care, caring, like you said, being curious so surprises me. For me, like the whole office should have like blown off fireworks and had like a parade for her, like around the hall that like show, that nobody has done this. You're like the only person who's reversed some of these numbers, like that they don't they don't care, they're not happy about it. It is just so disappointing. And and on that note, like like you just said, coaches, we are coaches. We've got pieces of paper that say we might know a thing or two about how to move or food, but we don't prescribe things. We don't give you medications or procedures or any of that stuff for somebody who's never done coaching. What are some surprising things you would want them to know about how coaching actually works? Because I think people have the idea that a coach is just going to tell them exactly what to do. And, and you have to report back having done all those things. What are coaching sessions actually like? What is the life cycle of coaching somebody around? So uh, coaching is really trying to get the individual to not only express where they want to go, but to try to find the tools within themselves to be able to do that. Exactly what you say. We're not telling them what to do. We're looking at what they're currently doing within their lifestyle. We're Fine. We're talking to them about the pieces that might be affecting those things that they're doing, whether that is their sleep pattern, their, their how they manage stress, what types of exercise are they doing, and obviously the nutrition that they're eating. And what are the things they want to do? So do they have grandkids, right? Do they have kids? Do they exercise a lot? Or are they not exercising at all to try to fit a lifestyle plan into the things that they want to do. That's in essence what a coach does. We help build in, we're accountable. We do check-ins with them on the week. We tweak their diet, their exercise plan, their sleeping to, to make it more optimal for the things that they want to do. Yeah, very well explained. And I mean, I think you and I know what it's like to take on clients and work with them for many, many years. And you just, these people are absolute family. You you come to know them, all the great conversations, laughing, crying together, like all of it is is amazing. But it's also interesting in, in the way that you're describing helping somebody with coaching, you might have the same kind of business model that Philip Ovedia has, the stay off my operating table. If people actually listen to him, he would put himself out of business. And sometimes that's what coaching is like as well. Like you think you're going to have a coach coach for years and years and years, you may only need a few sessions to really get the ball rolling and be like, you know what, I kind of got this and you don't really need a coach forever. Uh, 100%. Our biggest, let's say, compliment would be they don't need us anymore. And uh, I think 
what we try, we, we have a very high touch program. Uh, ours is privately. Um, most people who sign up for so they're seeing us two times a week in some cases, particularly those getting just going as we go along. It's it's more in you know more space in between. We try to educate. Uh, so that they, again, are making their own choices. We're not telling them what to do. We're giving them the tools and more information so they can decide where they fall on that decision process. But ultimately, we're hoping that they become their own coach. Yeah, love that. I love the way you say that. That's perfect. So tell us, you know, you're, you're 66, no plans of retiring. You look amazing. I love your posts where you're out doing stuff, always active and hiking and all the things we talked about out in the sunshine is amazing. What's in the future for you? What, what do you look at in the pipeline is something you're really excited about? Oh, I don't know that I have anything super exciting on the pipeline. Let's see. As like I said before, keep doing what we're doing. I'd like to uh, hit a few more conferences. We started talking about that prior to the show this year to keep building that network. And honestly, I, I'm not afraid of being a spokesperson about the benefits of meat. And I hope to maybe continue to inspire some of the females in my age group that this is okay, that this is an okay lifestyle that, um, you you're going to make ultimately your own choice and i think we do have to collectively get a little bit more together i agree with dr eric Baird that we need to become maybe a little more vocal but i think being vocal means also having that nuance that not everybody is fitting like you said earlier into a category of a strict carnivore or a strict keto but i think it's important that we get our message out so I'm hoping maybe 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 that's what I'm aspiring to is to get the message out and feel that people themselves can have a voice. Yeah. Well, we sure appreciate that you're not afraid to um, carry the banner, as it were, for for that is amazing. You mentioned conferences, and at, at the time of recording, this episode will actually be out by the time um, this episode comes out. But at the time that we're recording this, um, I'm going to a conference this weekend in Las Vegas. And as part of what I wanted to do, I decided for this one, I wanted to try to find people who are going to attend this conference who've never been to a low-carbohydrate conference before and just have a brief conversation, 10 or 15 minutes, have, what, what's your health story? what's your expectation of this conference what do you think it's going to be like and oh my, talking to people before their very first one they're like oh i hope i hope i get to see like dr ken berry or i'm bringing a book i wonder if ben bickman's gonna sign my book like you have no idea what you're about to get yourself into you are gonna be buzzing for months <laughs> it's, it's like borderline jealous i wish i could go back and like re-enjoy my very first one they're amazing Oh, that sounds so much fun. And good for you. Kudos, because those are the people we need to hear from. We, you know, we, we all talk amongst ourselves. Uh, um, and I think that's an important piece of the puzzle. So I'll be super excited to hear those stories. Um, and of course, you know, I've got another Gary Taub's book, the new one, Rethinking Diabetes. So, so I have good. to go to a conference and get his <laughs> autograph like I did on the last one. <laughs> so good. Uh, well, you were saying you might be able to make it to the Symposium for Metabolic Health in San Diego. I have that book. Um, I believe Gary Taub's will be there. So that's a great opportunity. I hope to see you there. That would be awesome. <laughs> um, and you're right. Like, I think I learned my lesson at one of the conferences. I decided to pay for the VIP events and do the dinners. And it was, you know, it's really expensive. And like, I end up kind of hanging out with the same people. I met a few wonderful people um, at the dinner, but by and large, I, I, I need, I try to remember to find the people who maybe look a little bit lost, who are maybe in the middle of their metabolic journey and try to like put my arm around them a little bit more and try to be more inclusive of them because otherwise I just hang out with like the same people every time. And like, it, you're right. There's so many people there that have amazing stories of recovering their health and, and fighting against everything that we've been talking about, like the medical system, the, the, the pharmaceutical industry that wants people on medications, the food industry that wants people addicted. So, um, um, yeah, it's just a really fun community. And like I said, it's just so energetic and you're just on a buzz for, for months after. Yeah. And just a little anecdote. Um, I had made uh, friends online and I know, I think he's actually been on your show. Has he not? Hal Kramer. Yeah. Who's running these assisted living homes here in Arizona and doing a fantastic job of really trying to get world protein focus, you know, with these individuals. And we met live for the first time at that conference. So it was fun to finally 
those people you've having some social media interaction and I'm just such a big fan of his work and I um maybe that's another little side gig goal I really like to ask him to help him or any of these other people that are, are working in those care home situations to sort of bring our our message to them and say hey you know um, there's other options out there. Yeah. You cannot say enough about the incredible work that Hal Kramer is doing. I got to meet him in person last year. It was wonderful to give him a hug. And one of my all time favorite episodes we ever did was with him and Eric Collette, who he works with at a mind for all seasons, I believe who does some of their mental recovery. And one of their, their former residents who was 70 years old, who literally reversed moderate to severe Alzheimer's and is at 70 years old back home. She's volunteering. Hearing. She wants to train to be a health coach. You're talking to this woman thinking like this woman is not demented. This woman was never demented. Give me a break. And these two are like, we cannot believe the difference in you. You can follow conversations. That's the kind of work that he is doing by just getting people the right amount of food, focusing on protein in those homes. Amazing. Amazing. So happy. It, yeah, absolutely. I, I, I'm just completely in awe of what he's doing there. Um, and we have actually a group here now, um, we're calling it the low carb Arizona that we're trying slowly to get together. Brian Linsky's in there. Uh, you know, we've, we've got, a quite a nice collection, uh, Allison Ridford, um, David Crutchfield. Uh, so we're Corey, uh, it, we're, we're all building that together. So, um, you know, we're, we're doing a little, our little part to, to get the word out there a little bit more. Ah, uh, I love that. Well, if that ever spreads northward up here yeah. to Utah, just let me know. <laughs> okay, we'll do oh, it. Krista, okay. this has been an awesome conversation. I really enjoy spending time with you. You're doing such great work, like I said, getting recognized by some pretty high up people, maybe not in the way that you wanted to, but uh, very interesting. Um, where would you like people to go to find you and connect with you and your work? Oh, absolutely. Thanks so much. This has been just a real treat. And again, you're doing incredible work. I am. Um, um, keep it up. That's all I want to say. Keep it up. Thank you. Uh, to find us, Square One Wellness and One, the number one, um, can find Robert and I. Our work is all on there. We're at Square One Wellness on Twitter. Same thing on Instagram. With Dr. Obadia, it's the ifixhearts.com. Uh, that's an easy one to remember. We're we're on there with a uh, metabolic coaching as well. So um, plenty of places and uh, hope to connect. Excellent. We will link to all of that in the show notes. I forgot to tell you earlier, I think this was really funny. In preparation for this conversation, I see you post Hup, Hall, and Hup all the time. And and you know, <laughs> obviously, it's part of the culture. And I didn't know exactly what it was. <laughs> I'm terrible with multitasking. I try to multitask way too much. And so yesterday, I looked it up started playing the video and then went back to your introduction that I was working on. And I was listening to this Hup Hall and Hup song. It's a song and it was absolutely terrible. And then I went back to look at it and it was like, it was playing an ad from YouTube. So it was like some stupid jingle from some product. So like I, I skipped the ad and then they started playing Hup Hall and Hup. I'm like, wow, this is great. This is a cool little tune. So Hup Hall and Hup. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> it's really funny. Um, well, we started talking about the Netherlands, right? You know, it's like a, you know, go team go. Uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, uh. In, in that, but it, I still feel that way about our community. We we need a little bit of cheering now and then. Um, we we can we can learn from the Dutch and all. We, maybe we need to start wearing more orange uh, in yes. that way. But definitely, and that's part of coaching is cheering people on, but also understanding their challenges and being able to support them. Yep. I am all in favor of wearing more orange and having those orange flares everywhere and just like asphy asphyxiate myself with that. But your the larger message is a much better one, which is you're right. We all need to come together and share this message and where we may have differences of somebody doing strict carnivore versus not strict carnivore. There's so many just nonsense things that we get involved with and we need to remember that we're all in this together and we can help support each other. And you're just such a great voice in the community for that. So Krista Hanks, thank you so very much again for coming on our show today we really appreciate you thank you for having me it's a true honor <laughs> uh, it was an honor to host you and this has been another episode of balanced body radio
Thank you so very much for continuing to listen to Boundless Body Radio. As 2023 has come to a close and we're starting another new year in 2024, I always try to reflect on not only the direction that we want to go in the future, but also how much we have grown in this last year. Our podcast has now generated well over 400,000 downloads from all over the world, and it's all thanks to fantastic listeners like yourself. I hope you are as excited for the new year as we are around here. The lineup of guests that we have coming up is absolutely staggering, and we're always striving to bring you the best content from the most amazing people in health, nutrition, and wellness. Remember that you can always head on over to our website to book a complimentary 30-minute session with us at myboundlessbody.com. On our homepage, there is a book now button where you can select a time to speak with us about your health and fitness plan, especially for the new year. We've absolutely loved chatting with so many of you out there to bounce ideas off each other and try to come up with plans to help you achieve specific goals. And seriously, I really do mean this. Even if it's just to say hello and introduce yourself, we absolutely love connecting with our listeners in the community. Be sure to check out our YouTube channel as well if you want to watch these full interviews and also shorter interviews on more specific topics that are taken from these interviews. We've gotten really great feedback over there, and it's also a really fun way to interact with people who comment. We read and reply to every single YouTube comment we get, so be sure to subscribe to our channel and leave as many comments as you like to keep the conversation going. And of course, if you haven't already, please leave us a five-star rating and review on Apple Podcasts. It really is the best way to make sure that the podcast gets out to more listeners. Your five-star ratings and reviews are the best way to support us here at Boundless Body and to support the podcast at Boundless Body Radio really only takes a moment and it's very meaningful to us. Cheers to 2024 and thank you again for listening to Boundless Body Radio.